Good evening. I'm Alice Taff, and I'm a member of the Humanities faculty here at UIS, and I have been accorded the honor tonight of introducing our speaker. So first, the two techie announcements. Turn off your buzzy, noisy things. And uh, when you uh, ask your questions afterwards, you'll use this mic so everybody can hear you, and you can be recorded. We're recording live. Um, so uh, I'm here to introduce Nina Cordes, who is an assistant professor of English at UIS. And um, Nina got her um, BA in community studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, then her MA in English at the University of Idaho, and her PhD in English at the University of Oregon. And I guess that makes you one of those English majors that Garrison Keillor is always talking about. Uh, her area of specialization is the transatlantic renaissance, um, focusing on texts produced in England, Spain, France, and Italy in the Americas during the 16th and 17th centuries. She has a new book coming out, Forms in Early Modern Utopia, the Ethnography of Perfection which is forthcoming from Ashgate Press in 2009. And those of you in the audience who are classical music buffs also recognize Nina as a soprano in the Juno Symphony Chorus and the Bach Society Chorus. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming Nina Cordes. Thank you, Alice. And thank you all for coming out on this presidential debate night, <laughs> which is quite, was quite interesting if you caught it. Um, so the title of my talk, um, Renaissance Utopian Thinking and Genocide, Why Is It Still Relevant? Um, I am a Renaissance era scholar, so um, we are talking about um, the 16th and 17th centuries, which is quite a long time ago. And um, it may seem too long ago in some ways, um, but that is considered the early modern period. And um, the reason is because a lot of the issues that were going on then are still very much with us. And um, I focus on utopias. I think a lot of people have their own idea of what utopia means. Because when I, anybody says, oh, it was such a utopia, you think it was you know, a great thing, right? And I think for most of us, a utopian place would be one where we could do pretty much what we wanted to do. Wouldn't that be a utopia? Um, I think for most of us, it would be. And um, the thing with Renaissance era utopias, however, is that they are not a just do your own thing kind of place. They're very, very prescriptive. And um, the societies, they're ideal societies, and they're very well and meticulously thought out. Um, I wouldn't want to live in any of them, personally. Can you hear me? Am I on? OK. Um, so um, utopia is also considered fictional. And um, yet it has a very well-documented career in the real world. And um, so I look at utopias that are both fictional and on paper, and I look at utopias that are projects that get carried out especially in the new world. Um, usually, um, we think of utopia as originating with Thomas More's famous text. And um, that was Utopia. It was published in 1516. And um, this is an illustration of the island of Utopia. As you can see, it's got, um, it's almost womb-shaped. And it has sort of a bay in the middle, and it's a semicircular island. And um, this, was, this was a very, very famous representation, and it gets picked up and carried out. Um, however, Moore writes of Utopia that it was not always an island. And I'm quoting from Moore's Utopia in a modern translation. It was written in Latin originally. Um, they say, and the appearance of the place confirms this, that their land was not always an island. But Utopus, who conquered the country and gave it his name, it had previously been called Abraxa. 
brought its rude and uncouth inhabitants to such a high level of culture and humanity that they now excel in that regard almost every other people. After subduing them at his first landing, he cut a channel 15 miles wide where their land joined the continent and caused the sea to flow around the country. So um, we have here um, the sort of kind of a backstory of utopia, the ideal island and society. Um, Moore moves on very quickly from this sort of originary episode. Um, we don't really hear a whole lot about Utopus and how he conquered Abraxa anymore in the rest of the um, book, actually. Um, Moore is um, actually bouncing off of a couple of influences. One is Plato's Republic, and um, that's a very famous dialogue some of you may be familiar with. Um, the other thing he's bouncing off of is um, Amerigo Vespucci, who traveled to the New World according to himself anyway. There was a dispute about that beginning almost right away. Um, Bartolome de las Casas, who um, was um, documenting both Columbus's and Vespucci's time period, had some questions about whether Vespucci's voyages were real. This is a map showing the four voyages that Vespucci claimed to have made, and he probably made at least two of them. But um, scholars are still debating over how authentic um, the other two are. Nevertheless, he was the first um, of the explorers to realize that what he had come upon in his voyages was literally a new world. It was something that was not mentioned in any of the ancient texts unlike Columbus, who went to his grave thinking he'd encountered Japan. And um, because of Vespucci's um, realization that what he had found was a new world, the whole entire hemisphere bears his name. The feminized version of Amerigo, his first name is America. And um, it first appeared um, as such in a map published in 1507 by the Dutch Waldseemuller, um, who um, also published Vespucci's accounts of um, some of his voyages, and it was an early modern bestseller. In fact, Moore writes it into Utopia because his narrator, Raphael Hithliday, whose name um, loosely translated means purveyor of nonsense, um, actually claims to have been a sailor with Vespucci and um, to have traveled from what is probably now around Venezuela south across the, um, into the equatorial zones about which almost nothing was known in Europe. Um, and um, there he encountered an island, a very enlightened people called Utopia. So um, the, um, this, the fact that Moore is familiar with Vespucci really shows in his text. Um, this is a, a 17th century illustration by um, Theodore de Brie, who was um, an illustrator who traveled and made drawings and sketches um, of various, from reports and encounters in the New World. These are actually natives um, in Florida, what is now Florida. Um, but Vespucci, although he didn't, was never in Florida, he was in other parts of the Caribbean. And, um, what Moore does um, after reading Vespucci is he gives us an ethnography of the utopian people. So most of Utopia, the text describing the ideal society, is framed as an ethnography. We learn about the customs of the people, um, how they deal with foreign nations, how they deal with wealth, how they deal with their elderly, how they treat education and all kinds of things like that, very rather meticulous. Of course, all invented, but um, the, um, the whole notion that you're going to describe a people and um, tell, another, tell others about how they live um, begins around this time seriously. Um, Moore kept up, he was a humanist. I don't know if any of you have heard of Thomas Moore. He lived in England. He was. Um, the Chancellor, Lord Chancellor under Henry VIII. He was beheaded eventually by Henry VIII for opposing Henry's um, divorce from Catherine of Aragon to marry Anne Boleyn, whom Henry beheaded later too. But um, in any case, um, 
more um, was a humanist who corresponded with other humanists all over the continent. Um, Erasmus was a friend of his, um, the great humanist um, from Holland. He also corresponded with humanists in places like Croatia and Bosnia and Hungary, um, all over, of course, Western, what we think of as Western Europe. And um, for a long time, he and his humanist friends kept up a fiction in their correspondence carried on in Latin, of course, that's how they could all communicate, that utopia was a real place and that somehow it had been discovered and that people, that they, they debated the excellence of that government and um, exchanged letters that, that really talked about it as though it were real. So, um, <clears throat> One of the things that I do um, in my book, and I'm going to recap a little bit, is focus on some of the genres that go into the making of early modern utopia because um, we think of it as a fictional genre often. And in fact, um, utopia is made up of a lot of subgenres, not all of them considered fictional. And I'd like to just go over what some of them are. Um, one um, that shows up is travel writing, which isn't always credible in this time period. These are anthropophagy, anthropophagi, however <laughs> you say it in Greek. They eat people. Um, these are from the travel writings of um, one Mandeville, who's probably a collection of writers. But Mandeville's Travels was an extremely popular text. Um, in the 15th century, the 1400s or thereabouts. It was very widely read and it um, talked about wonders of the world, such as people whose um, faces are below their shoulders, their heads are below their shoulders, and people joined at the hip, and dog-headed monsters, um, which um, Columbus actually mentions. Um, he conflates the dog-headed monsters with the anthropophagy and comes up with the term cannibals. And that's a term that gets attached to um, Americans, New World indigenous inhabitants from Columbus on out. Um, so Moore actually refers to, he doesn't refer to Mandeville by name, but he discredits travel accounts when he writes, he has his narrator in Utopia say, well, what I'm telling you isn't the kinds of things that you're going to hear in these travel narratives, all these wondrous sorts of fake things, we all know they're fake. I'm going to tell you about a society that is well governed and has very judicious laws. And that's what I know you're all interested in. Um, nevertheless, because of the time period when Moore is writing, he perpetuates what we now know are quite fantastic notions about the world um, below the equator and in the equatorial zones. Um, for example, that there are desert wastes all around the equator that are uninhabitable by people. Um, so, um, but it's just a, t a sign of the times. Um, a lot of times travel writing becomes conflated with ethnography. And um, part of the reason is because um, one of the earlier, um, what we consider travel writers and or ethnographers, depending on who's describing him as the Greek Herodotus, who traveled widely and wrote about peoples that he encountered. And he's to this day spoken of either as a travel writer or an ethnographer or as an ethnologist, depending on who is doing the writing and what they want to say about him. Um, ethnography, however, as we've come to know it, is the meticulous observation of another culture, and um, usually ethnographers record what they observe, um, and then the ethnography is, um, what it does is it represents a culture to a different culture. So ethnographies abound in the New World. All the early exploration narratives are full of them. Um, this is kind of a pictorial ethnography. It shows, um, boat building in action um, among the Algonquian. Um, it's, a, it's a 17th century engraving. So you can see how um, people go about building boats, um, Native Americans here in this case. Um, so um, ethnography, if you want to start with Herodotus, it depends on if you want to. In the New World, it begins with Columbus, 
Um, Columbus's ethnographic details are rather sketchy and um, not always very meticulous. He incorporates, as many people do in his time period, what we would call the fantastic with his factual um, reporting. Um, for example, in the, with the dog-headed cannibal bit, um, that gets mixed in with descriptions of what people were wearing or what they ate. Um, Columbus is always in search of cannibals and never quite finding them. Um, but, um, Vespucci does the same thing in his ethnographies, which um, do influence more quite a lot. Um, he writes about people who eat other people, and he writes about um, the different native peoples that he encountered. There are lots of features that are mentioned um, in regards to natives of the New World that become incorporated with um, Thomas More's utopians. And um, among them, for example, um, they, um, of course, the New World natives um, hardly wear any clothing at all, but yet their skin is of a kind of a sunburnt color, and so they, um, they're all very, um, they appear rather uniform because they're, um, they have beautiful bodies, but they're, um, and they're all this color, this tawny lion color. So um, part of what I um, argue in my, in my um, treatment of Utopia is that I think Moore borrows ideas from Vespucci, and then he kind of transforms them through a philosophical engagement in them. So whereas the natives all go about fairly naked, what Moore has his um, utopians do, of course, they aren't going to go around na naked, but they wear clothing that is very similar to, to every, it's, it's not colored, it's kind of homespun, natural colored, and they all wear the same colored clothing, and um, it's all very uniform all across the island. Um, utopians despise wealth. They, um, they, they hoard a lot of it because they use it in order to influence other governments, but they themselves look down upon it, and their children are taught to play with jewels um, and gold as though it was just playthings. They laugh at people who use gold, for example, to adorn themselves because they make chamber pots with it. And um, in a way, that's an echo of what, um, what, what we learn in Vespucci and other ethnographers of the Native American peoples that were encountered by these explorers, that they don't value wealth very much. They were willing to trade things like pearls for little tiny trinkets and mirrors. And um, of course, the Europeans admire them on one hand for being so um, non-materialistic, and on the other hand, look down on them for being so naive. So we have this double-edged thing going on. So um, the... Um, because New World travel writing consists a great deal of ethnography, so do the utopias that are written in this time period. Um, not only Moore's, um, the Italian um, utopist Tommaso Campanella, who wrote The City of the Sun, has a big ethnography um, going. Um, Francis Bacon's New Atlantis is, consists of largely of ethnograph ethnographic kinds of description. And these are fictional societies. That's the difference. We have fictional societies and their customs um, being described as though they're real, as though travelers were describing um, actual um, people that they encountered. Um, one other feature of these early modern utopias is that they are written as dialogues or something that resembles dialogues. Moore's Utopia is a dialogue, so is Campanella's City of the Sun. This is a picture of Socrates engaging in dialogue. It's hard to illustrate dialogue. You have to find people talking to each other. Um, and of course, Plato has a lot of dialogues. Um, Plato's Republic is a dialogue. But um, although um, Plato's Republic, which is an ideal society, takes shape largely through discourse, through people talking about what would make an ideal society, Moore takes this a step further and says, well, this society actually exists somewhere in the world. That um, it's, it's posited as being in an actual place, though Moore coined the word utopia. Um, it's Greek. And depending on how you write the initial letter, it means either happy place or no place. And so it's a happy no place. And so um, in a way, that has also set 
um, our modern thinking of what a utopia is. It's an ideal place, therefore supposedly a happy place, yet we have a notion that such things can never come to pass. A lot of times utopia is described as pie in the sky, and we still have that notion. So, um, is that what you think? <laughs> well, <laughs> do, do I? Do I think it's pie in the sky? It depends on whose utopia it is. And I'm going to come to that. That's a good question. Is it really pie in the sky? Is it possible? I think that's a question that's been haunting Western European and, of course, now American imagination since more, because, or maybe since Plato, because people keep inventing these ideal societies. There's plenty of them. And um, I can find myself to the... 16th and 17th centuries um, for a reason. I, I don't vouch for anything beyond that, but I can tell you a lot about the utopias from that time period. Um, so dialogue, like travel writing, um, is a quasi-fictional form or genre because it's supposed to mimic overheard conversation as though you really heard it. Whoever wrote it heard this. And um, so that lends sort of a verisimilitude or kind of a true-to-life quality to dialogue. And the other thing it does is allows the author to uh, distance usually himself, sometimes herself, from whatever it is that they're reporting through the dialogue because they can always say, well, this is what I heard. It's not what I think. I'm just telling you what I heard. And Moore is doing that um, also in his Utopia, um, which is a dialogue starts out as a dialogue concerning um, whether somebody should serve um, a prince. What kind, of a, what kind of a counselor should serve a prince? This is because Henry VIII was, um, was pressuring Moore to enter his service, and Moore had a sense of how dangerous that might be, of course, um, something that was um, borne out by the fact that he lost his head literally serving Henry. Um, but there are a lot of real-life um, projects and agendas, especially in the New World. Um, one of the things, um, when we look at humanism in the Renaissance era, um, humanists are, um, it's a philosophy, it's kind of a, an agenda of education. Humanists were the people who recovered um, ancient Greek and the knowledge that, um, that was transmitted by ancient Greeks, a lot of which had kind of disappeared or gone underground during the Middle Ages and was preserved in the monasteries, um, actually preserved in the Arabic world. Um, but um, the humanists recovered that and began to study Greek texts. In fact, Plato was very little known until um, the Renaissance because most of those texts had been lost. They knew Aristotle, but not Plato. And um, so, um, but what happens is that um, a lot of these humanists have um, ideas about what constitutes um, a good education, good government. A lot of humanists became educators. They educated people like Henry VIII um, and other um, wealthy or, and or noble um, um, Europeans of this time period. They're also counselors to kings. A lot of the popes are, um, everybody who's educated in this time period has what we would call a humanist education, which isn't exactly what we think of as humanist now. But it, it does um, focus a lot on um, the knowledge of Latin and Greek and recovering old Greek texts and the old Greek um, knowledge. Um, so what happens in the time period is um, when Columbus encounters the so-called New World, it's new to Western Europe, of course, not to the people who are already here, um, for a lot of the humanist projects take on an added luster because all of a sudden it's not just that you can come up with an ideal society or, or a blueprint for one, you actually have a place in which it can be sort of carried out. You have an arena in which to stage it. Because one of the functions of ethnography and reporting on, on people um, is, is to make them transparent. You're telling another culture about the culture that you're observing, and of course, um, 
if you're an explorer and you're a Western European explorer, you're doing that reporting from your own vantage point, your own perspective, which of course has to be very ethnocentric. It's, it comes with the territory. And so the way you're going to be describing people who are strange to you, unfamiliar in all their customs, you will be also interpreting their customs for home consumption. And so people who read your accounts or hear about them back home say, wow, we, we, can, we really know what it's like over there. Um, actually, um, the, at the time that Utopia is published in 1516, there's not a whole lot known at all about the New World. In fact, most of what is known is not corroborated at all. So anything could go on in the New World. Um, so um, it's, it becomes this, this arena in a way where you can stage all kinds of projects, and people do. Um, Cortes, Hernan Cortes, who conquered Mexico, conquered the Aztec in 1521. Um, he's a Spaniard. You probably have all heard of him. Um, he, um, in a way, was, was carrying out what might be called a utopian agenda. He's conquering um, New World territory for the crown of Spain. This is a depiction of um, Cortes um, and Malinche, who was uh, the woman, indigenous woman that he um, in, met. And um, she became his mistress and also his interpreter. And um, it's through her that he um, was able to make contact with a lot of the different groups and peoples that were living in what is now Mexico. Um, this picture shows Cortes and Malinche meeting with representatives of um, the Tlaxcalteca, um, who um, were a group that was bitter toward the Aztec and therefore um, made an alliance with Cortes and the Spanish army. Um, and um, so Cortes was able to, um, in a way, he's, he's like Utopus. I can't help but think of him as a Utopus figure because he uses his audacity and his um, sometimes blind luck, but sometimes um, he's able to take advantage of, of situations as they arise. And he, of course, we know that he um, conquered um, Montezuma, well, the, the leader we call Montezuma, and um, the Aztec. And um, so um, Mexico is now, well, now a Spanish-speaking country was under Spain for a very long time. Um, actually, in 1535, which is you know, not too long, about 16 years or so after Cortes conquered Mexico, there's already, um, the Spanish are already establishing um, co colonies there. Um, Bishop Vasco de Quiroga, who is in Mexico City, what we now call Mexico City, read Thomas More's Utopia and thought it was a really, really good idea. And so um, he tried to get Ferdinand and Isabella interested in funding a project to um, establish um, settlements along the lines of More's Utopia. And they weren't interested. So he actually spent some of his own money to do so. So in 1535, which was the year that More was executed in England, um, Bishop Vasco de Quiroga actually founded a settlement based on Moore's Utopia in um, what is now Mexico City, um, called it, um, so um, the Hospital. Um, so, and it actually lasted for about a hundred years, which is amazing. A hundred years later, people report that it's still in existence. Um, whether Moore ever intended for his fictional society to be actually implemented is a good question. Probably, I would say not. His utopia, unlike a lot of others, is actually humorous and written very tongue in cheek. And he, um, he gives a lot of signals as to why it's not a real place. It's a fiction. And um, so um, the point being that no matter what kind of fiction or blueprint anybody can come up with for, for a so-called ideal society. Well, even if you intend it as a fiction, somebody somewhere will always be willing to put it to the test. Now, um, uh, the French Jesuits in um, what is now the Great Lakes region of, of Canada also were active um, in the 17th century. And among their agendas was um, the conversion, of course, of native populations 
They were especially active among the Huron. And um, one of the things they wanted to do was to um, establish a society along um, the lines of the early Christian society in the Book of Acts. And um, they sought martyrdom, actually. Um, they were, um, the Jesuits believed that martyrdom was one of the greatest things they could do in order to, um, well, to, of course, to solidify their faith, but also to bring other people to the faith. Um, Jean de Brébeuf, um, I love this image. <laughs> one of this is from, from um, Quebec. Um, a statue in Quebec, um, was one of their martyrs. He was tortured to death by the Iroquois and um, while proselytizing and um, became one of the um, saints who was canonized. Um, the mission among the Huron ultimately failed. Um, it was partly due to distrust, but um, the presence of the French and English um, actually exacerbated divisions among um, the native peoples. This is a picture of an Iroquois warrior from the 18th century, um, so a little later. But um, so a lot of times these utopian agendas um, run into obstacles, but they have consequences which um, sort of tend to play out among the peoples on whom they are imposed. For example, um, the, um, the native populations in um, what is now Canada who were um, affected by French Jesuits um, and other French um, um, interventions. Um, there's so many divisions among them that when the French come in and um, they are able to um, distort what, was, what used to be the traditions and um, lines of commerce um, among the peoples who lived there. And now there's something new introduced, a new element um, that wasn't there before. Um, the Puritan errant into the wilderness is um, kind of utopian. This is a depiction of the landing of the Mayflower. Um, one thing that's interesting in uh, Moore's utopia is um, the treatment that Moore gives to colonization, the whole notion of colonization. Because, of course, utopians do colonize other places. Uh, Moore writes, and I'm reading from uh, Modern Translation of Utopia, and if the population throughout the entire island exceeds the quota, of course they have a quota for every city and everything because they're very well planned, um, then they enroll citizens out of every city and plant a colony under their own laws on the mainland near them, wherever the natives have plenty of unoccupied and uncultivated land. Those natives who want to live with the utopian settlers are taken in. When such a merger occurs, the two peoples gradually and easily blend together, sharing the same way of life and customs, much to the advantage of both. For by their policies, the utopians make the land yield an abundance for all, which had previously seemed too barren and paltry even to support the natives. But if the natives will not join in living under their laws, the utopians drive them out of the land they claim for themselves. And if they resist, make war on them. The utopians say it's perfectly justifiable to make war on people who leave their land idle and waste, yet forbid the use of it to others who, by the law of nature, ought to be supported from it. And um, there is a lot of interesting stuff going on in that passage that gets picked up on and um, carried out, especially among the Puritan settlers in New England um, the Puritan errand into the wilderness um, paid a lot of lip service to converting the native population, but in actual fact um, didn't do even as much as the French did and tended to demonize um, Native Americans. Um, the, the, um, the Puritans also um, tended to think um, the typological thinking that is typical of um, Puritans in this time period tends to see um, biblical precedent in everything they do, or they look for biblical precedents, so that um, the um, Puritan settlers are equated with the children of Israel in the Promised Land. And um, if you read things like um, captivity narratives, Mary Rowlandson's famous captivity narrative, um, she is a settler um, in New England who was captured during what was called King Philip's War. And um, she is taken by a band of um, 
of, of Indians and um, is held captive until she gets ransomed out again. But she talks about it um, heavily interpreted through a biblical lens. She can't come across a babbling brook without thinking of the rivers of Babylon, for example, because um, everything that happens to her has a precedent in, in scripture, and she's also, they always are looking for that. Um, and um, the whole thing, um, the equation of the dissenting um, Protestants of England who are the Puritans, um, the equation of, of the Protestants um, with the children of Israel leads to certain consequences. Um, one of them is that whole notion of land that is fallow and waste because um, the law of nature that Moore refers to, the natural law is often evoked to, um, to back up claims to unused land or land that is perceived to be unused um, on the parts of the settlers. And um, the reason is because by the law of nature, land ought to be cultivated and made use of for, um, you know, for people who live there. Um, there were a couple of reasons why um, a lot of the um, land in, the, in, say, around New England is perceived as unused and waste. One is because um, after the initial encounter with Europeans, disease catastrophically reduced the native populations to the point where some places did seem um, uninhabited just because of the reduction of people living there. Um, the other is because a lot of the native um, traditions and cultures um, moved around the land. They would move with the seasons and with the food supply. So you may, maybe there, you didn't see people in one part of the country at any particular time. That did not mean that the land was um, being unused or uninhabited. Um, the Puritans and other settlers had plenty of evidence, in fact, that native peoples did cultivate a lot of the land. But the law of nature or the natural law is a really good argument for doing what you want to do. So um, um, one of the things I look at is John Cotton's sermon to um, John Winthrop and company who set sail um, for um, New England in 1630. John Cotton preached a sermon to them. They, the, um, they, founded, they set sail to found Massachusetts Bay Colony. And um, John Cotton, who is the great-grandfather of um, Cotton Mather of the famous Salem witch burnings, um, John Cotton preached a sermon called God's Promise to His Plantations, in which his Puritan audience is assured that they're justified in removing to New England. And uh, Cotton urges colonists not to make war on the poor natives in his sermon and tells them that God will plant them in their new home, that God will protect them, though he adds on, neglect not walls and bulwarks and fortifications um, for your own defense. Well, defense against what? Um, oops. Wrong. This, this is the nightmare of the settler, um, the, the Indian attack. Um, of course, um, the Puritans were also perfectly capable of doing the same. This is um, an illustration of King Philip's war. King Philip was um, a Native American um, leader and um, kind of rebelled against a lot of the Puritan settlements. Um, and, um, and of course, it was during King Philip's War that Mary Rowlandson was taken captive. Um, the, um, what happened in um, 1637, partly um, the King Philip's War is later on in the century, but um, there were plenty of skirmishes between settlers and Indians. And um, finally, in 1637, um, the Puritans actually massacred the Pequot nation at what is now Mystic, Connecticut. And um, it's interesting because, um, for example, um, Bradford, um, William Bradford of um, you know, the original um, colony of the, came, um, the people who came on the Mayflower kept a journal and he barely mentions this massacre um, in his journal. But um, we do have an account, a first-person account by John Mason, who was the leader of the Puritan army. And this is what he wrote about um, the surrounding of the Pequot fortification. 
The fire was kindled on the northeast side to windward, which did swiftly overrun the fort, to the extreme amazement of the enemy and great rejoicing of ourselves, some of them climbing to the top of the palisado, others of them running into the very flames. Thus were they now at their wit's end, who not many hours before exalted themselves in their great pride, threatening and resolving the utter ruin and destruction of all the English, exulting and rejoicing with songs and dances. But God was above them, who laughed his enemies and the enemies of his people to scorn, making them as a fiery oven. Thus were the stout-hearted spoiled, having slept their last sleep, and none of their men could find their hands. Thus did the Lord judge among the heathen, filling the place with dead bodies. It's kind of doesn't sound terribly Christian to us now. But if you've noticed, scripture is invoked here because actually Mason is quoting um, from the Psalms. Um, the Lord will laugh them to scorn. The Lord will have them in derision, um, speaking of the Lord's enemies. And um, in some measure, Cotton in his sermon um, helped create the attitude that finally allowed this um, episode of genocide to transpire because um, he keeps invoking scripture and um, the, the kind of scripture that places, um, that justifies, of course, the children of Israel in the original, but because he's conflating his um, Puritan emigres with the children of Israel, it becomes, um, san it becomes sanctified in a way. Their errand is sanctified and is um, equated to um, um, the prom searching for the promised land and taking over something that has been promised to them by God. Um, so um, the um, last thing I'd like to say about Utopias, this is um, a board game from a modern board game. Um, if you notice the um, island that's laid out on the table in front of, who is this, Utopus perhaps? Um, it's shaped like, well, it is the original Utopia. Um, and um, what I would like to point out is that behind every utopia there is a utopus, and um, that um, historically, um, although we like to think of utopias as fictional, idealistic, um, ideal societies, good, and perhaps they can be. Um, at the same time, um, one thing I often like to say and I say to my students is one person's utopia is another person's nightmare because, um, for example, the Soviet Union styled itself as a worker's utopia. And the Soviet um, leaders, the Bolshevik leaders of the, um, of the Russian Revolution were very familiar with Thomas More and Utopia and with Tommaso Campanella and the City of the Sun admired them and wanted to emulate them. Um, in fact, um, attempted half-heartedly to em emulate some features of these utopias. And yet, um, we know what happened to that vision. Um, however, ideally, it may have started out, unfortunately. Um, it didn't stay that way. Um, and that is why um, I, I would argue that um, Behind our notions of utopia lie older notions of utopia that are much more prescriptive and um, that I think we need to be aware of. And we always need to be aware of whose utopia it is that we're looking at. Thank you. I'll take questions if anyone has them. Oh, yeah, you have to use the... It's been a while since I read Utopia, but I remember that there was, the society was formed on the back of a slave class, I believe, right? That yeah. allowed, you know, their toil allowed the citizens of Utopia to live in this exalted society. And I'm wondering if any of the, you know, the new Utopias that were actually created carried that out or that was part of, of that plan? Yes, to some degree, and in, in Moore's Utopia, the slaves are actually, slavery is a punishment for various crimes, among them adultery. And, um, or um, sometimes they take in slaves from other countries um, that 
fight in war or they take slaves in war and um, they take, um, they, they enslave people um, who then, yeah, are slaves until they can sort of work their way out of um, slavery by their good behavior. Um, and there are other societies also do have um, slave classes, um, Campanella does. Um, later on, um, some utopias gloss over this feature. It, the, every utopia is kind of selective in the features it wants to emphasize. But yeah, in more, that's definitely there. But then uh, when they attempted to create you know, a utopian, you talked about the bishop that right. tried to emulate that. Did they carry through to that level of class distinction too? You know, um, I don't know that they had actual slaves. The, the people that um, Bishop Vasco de Quiroga established his, his version of Moore's utopia with were um, actually um, orphaned native peoples of that region. They, there was a whole lot, because of the Spanish conquest and the ensuing war that followed, um, there were a lot of um, people who were left um, homeless, orphaned, displaced populations, and um, Quiroga's working with them. Um, I don't think he is enslaving them. Um, the Spanish, of course, were enslaving indigenous people, and maybe Quiroga felt he didn't need to um, add to that. I think he's more benevolent in his interpretation, so I don't think he actually had slaves. But it's interesting that um, because these utopias that get carried out in the New World are often um, carried out among people who are displaced, and, um, and a lot of indigenous populations who are displaced by the arrival of um, colonists and conquerors and other settlers. So yeah, there is slavery. Anyone else? Oh. You need the mic. <laughs> hey, do you think Karl Marx in the manifesto is actually envisioning a utopia? Yeah. Well, Karl Marx is famously against utopias um, and says he doesn't believe in them, but but of course, you know, as we, you can see with the um, Bolsheviks and the um, so original Soviet government, um, his, his vision does become interpreted as a utopia. Um, I think there's a double-edged sword to that because of our um, notion that utopias are pie in the sky and can never be carried out. And so we tend to think of anything we put a utopian label on is unrealistic, quote unquote, and therefore, However, um, Marx didn't think his notions were unrealistic. He thought they were very well, much, you know, they could be put into practice. The fact that they haven't successfully for any length of time, who knows? You know, there's arguments that they've never really been followed very well. So, I mean, what we saw in the Soviet Union was a total corruption of the manifesto. So, who knows? It was interesting to hear of Hernán Cortés being a utopist. Um, I come from a Latin American country, and that's precisely one where we never heard to describe him. Um, <laughs> <I'm sure. I> was, <laughs> um, can you elaborate on how come yeah. you just brought, brought his name into the book? Yeah, I, I, I will, because you're right. I, I don't think of him as a utopist particularly either. Um, I think it depends on how you define utopia. And um, what I'm looking at is um, people who have um, agendas in which they want to impose what they perceive to be a better way of life upon another group of people. Now, uh, admittedly, this can be done in a very cynical manner. And um, I don't know how sincere, I, I mean, uh, Cortes is, um, you know, of course, he's, he's um, a subject of the Spanish crown, and he's doing this all for, for the Spanish crown. But he is um, imposing the Spanish way of life, and, and then, of course, the Spanish bureaucracy that takes over on indigenous people in some ways where um, I think he's kind of behaving as a utopist by coming in. When he comes in, the Spanish then reshape the land that they come to occupy. Well, usually the teaching is that, our teaching actually was that he did it because of greed and he happened to do it under the name of the kings of Spain. 
And when uh, everything was, you know, there was a point during the conquest that he wanted to, uh, the, his own people wanted to turn around, and he just, you know, right. killed them so he can continue doing, kill the horses and kill whoever was against him, so he can continue to do the conquest. And uh, he used the Spanish crown and the Catholic uh, religion just to increase his, uh, his worth, and he, you know, so he can become more and more rich. It was... I don't think uh, that he, he right. was doing that out of bringing a new system. He brought the new system so he can get more wealthy. Right, and, and you're right, and, and he's not altruistic at all. In fact, because of him, his intervention, a lot, of, a lot of destruction followed. And yes, I think his greed was a big motive for him. The, 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 thing, um, the parallel that I draw with him is the, um, the way that he is able to come in, utilize what he finds, and then um, by imposing a different system for whatever his personal reasons are. Um, I mean, we all know that, that Mexico gets totally reshaped and um, the, the um, Aztec, and it, of course not everybody loved the Aztec in that region um, either, but, but the whole country becomes now subject to the Spanish crown and everything is changed. And Bishop Vasco de Quiroga can do what he does because of that disruption and because everything has been changed. Um, utopias aren't always for the better, which is part of my point. We think of them as ideal societies and sometimes, yeah, they go wrong. Or people want to impose them for personal reasons. Um, so. <laughs> my question is pretty simple. Um, has there been, or is there now, utopians in Alaska? Oh, wow. Um, I'm not sure. Um, it, again, it would, I think, depend on uh, you know, your definition of what a utopia is. And if, if you're in a society that you believe to be an ideal society and you're living in it, perhaps it is. I know, for example, the colony of old believers on the Kenai, you know, the Staravere that came over from Russia, maybe they think they're in a utopia or they thought they were in a utopia. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, it's a possibility. Um, again, utopia is subjective. That's, I think, is one of the points that, that um, I, I want to make is that um, it's really hard to define a utopian society that everybody is going to agree is utopian. So I don't know much more about any utopian societies in Alaska. If anybody does, I'd be curious. So. I can speak exactly to that last point because I was a high school English teacher, English major, uh, at Nikolaevsk, and uh, we had the utopian unit and I brought up this point to my students. I said, now many people think that right here in Nikolaevsk, you have a utopian society. And they looked at each other, the students, and said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's really true. Well, one of the features of Moore's utopia is that his utopians love to get up at 4 AM and, and go to lectures to improve them. <laughs> I know, and the, the, I draw the line, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not my idea of a utopia. So, yeah. <laughs> Is that it? Oh, well, I don't see you. Thank you.